Okay, this is chapter three, control volume analysis, part eight. In this video, I'm gonna talk about applications of the Bernoulli equation. I'm gonna talk about something called static pressure and dynamic pressure. And then I'll talk about the stagnation point flow and uh, stagnation pressure that happens at a stagnation point. Then I'll talk about the application of these concepts to an instrument called a pitot tube which is an instrument, a very simple instrument for measuring the local fluid velocity. And finally, I'll end by uh, doing a simple numerical example of calculating the wind speed in a wind tunnel using a pitot tube. In the last video, we, we derived Bernoulli's equation. We showed that it was P over rho plus V squared upon two plus GZ equals a constant. Of course, always applied along the streamline. So we have the, the flow work term, the kinetic energy term, and the potential energy term. And the combination of those three add up to a constant. Now, if we multiply by density, we get this expression here, uh, P plus rho V squared upon two plus rho GZ equals a constant. Now, this is a, a dimensionally uh, homogeneous e equation, so each term you can see has the units of pressure. And this first term here is just called static pressure. The rho v squared upon 2 is referred to in fluid dynamics as the dynamic pressure. So the static pressure is just the pressure you would experience if you were moving with the flow. The dynamic pressure is the pressure that could be generated if the flow was decelerated uh, to zero at a stagnation point, and we'll talk about what that is in a moment. And then rho gz is just the hydrostatic gradient, you know, gamma z that we saw in chapter two. Before we talk about pitot tubes, I would like to talk about something called the stagnation point and stagnation pressure that occurs at a stagnation point. I've shown here over on the right-hand side an object uh, in with laminar flow and they've injected sort of streams of dye to show the streamlines. We talked about this in, I think, the first video of chapter three. Now, if you look at this streamline that's exactly on the center line here of this object, I'm gonna define two points. Point one is way upstream and point two is right at the nose where the flow, sort of on one side of it, the flow goes goes upwards and on the uh, other side of it the flow goes downwards. If you were to analyze this, if you could measure the velocity along this streamline, you'd see that the velocity decreases, the speed of the flow decreases, and so we have velocity v1 at point 1, but at point 2 right at the surface the velocity goes to zero. Now this is not by the action of viscosity, this is just by the, uh, the fact that the flow uh, decelerates as it reaches that stagnation point. So we can apply Bernoulli's equation. So as it says in the, the statement here, on the center line, the center line streamline impinges on the leading edge of the object and the fluid decelerates to zero velocity at point two. So we can apply, as we always do, Bernoulli's equation at point one and point two, and we're gonna ignore changes in elevation so there's no Z term, and we get one half rho V squared plus P1. So the kinetic energy plus the pressure at point one equals the dynamic pressure plus the static pressure at point two. But as I just discussed, the velocity at point two is zero. So we get, we solve for P2, we get that P2 equals P1 plus this dynamic pressure, one half rho V1 squared. So what's happened here is the kinetic energy at one has uh, been converted into pressure energy. We've got a higher pressure at point two than at point one, and that's because we've had a conversion of kinetic energy in the flow into uh, pressure energy. And the pressure at point two is called the stagnation pressure. It's the highest pressure you can get. Uh, it's the combination of the static pressure plus the dynamic pressure as the flow is sort of reversibly uh, decelerated to zero in a, remember, there's no losses in the system. There's no viscous losses. Just so you can relate to this, I, I wanted to mention that in part, flow stagnation is, is the source of the force 
that you feel when you stick your hand out the uh, car window that's moving down the highway. The flow, uh, the airflow decelerates as it hits your hand and creates a pressure, a stagnation pressure on the front side of your hand, and that you know pushes your hand backwards. It's actually one of the causes of aerodynamic drag. It's called pressure drag. The other cause is viscous drag. We've already talked about that, caused by the viscosity of fluid. One of the reasons I'm telling you about stagnation pressure and static pressure is because it has a very useful application to an instrument called a pitot tube. And I've shown a picture here of a pitot tube. I think that's on the, the wing of a, uh, of a Cessna, but they're also, they're also used on uh, large jet aircraft to measure the wind speed. And what they are is they're a tube. This is actually called a pitot-static tube because it measures the, the stagnation pressure at this little port here. And then there's, there's a, a separate chamber that's isolated that measures uh, the static pressure around the periphery of the tube. And so it's the difference between the, the stagnation pressure and the static pressure that can be used. It can be converted with a simple equation into, into uh, a velocity. In the basement of Kerr Hall, we have a setup with a little wind tunnel with a, a pitot static tube. And I've shown over here, it's actually the, the manufacturer's Dwyer, Dwyer Instruments. And it, it measures the, as the same idea here, the, the stagnation pressure at the, the, the nose of the tube. And then there's a separate chamber that measures the, the static pressure on the sides of the tube. And these are communicated to two different hoses on an inclined manometer. You know, recall that from chapter two. And the deflection of the inclined manometer can be used to get the, the wind speed in the, in the wind tunnel. Okay, so this is an example of uh, using a pitot tube uh, to measure the air velocity in a wind tunnel. We have almost this exact setup uh, with an inclined manometer in the lab, in the fluids lab in East Kerr Hall. So the problem says a pitot tube is connected to a manometer to measure the air velocity in a wind tunnel if the specific gravity of the manometer fluid is 0 0.85 what is the air speed so you've got you can see in the diagram that you've got a 20 millimeter deflection of the manometer and you're told in the problem statement diagram that it's air at 25 degrees C and atmospheric pressure is 98 kilopascals and we're after calculating the air velocity here. So we start with Bernoulli's equation and we apply Bernoulli's equation between two points. That's how we will, in fact, that's how we'll always apply Bernoulli's equation. And so we're going to pick one point here, point one, well upstream of the pitot tube but on the sort of the center line of the of the nose of the pitot tube and then point two is going to be right at the stagnation point because a pitot tube uses the fact that the flow stagnates at the nose of the pitot tube and that pressure rise is what causes the manometer deflection which allows you to make the measurement so now we write Bernoulli's equation at point one and point two and you can use any form you want. I'm going to use this one, P1 upon rho plus V1 squared upon 2 plus Z1 equals P2 upon rho plus V2 squared upon 2 plus Z1. So we have the pressure energy term, the kinetic energy term, and the elevation uh, or potential energy term uh, on at each point and the amount of energy in the flow remains constant at point one and point two. Now we can see of course this is a manometer so the you can tell that gravity must be acting in this direction so Z1 equals Z2 there's no significant uh, change in the altitude of the fluid the elevation so we can cancel Z1 oops I should be a 2 there uh, and Z2 and as we discussed in some detail uh, 
a pitot tube works by the flow stagnating, coming to a complete stop at point two. Uh, so all of the kinetic energy at point one is converted into pressure energy, uh, and so V2 equals zero because we have stagnation. So we can cross out that term. So now we can solve, this is a very quite a simple example, we can solve for uh, V1 and it's going to equal 2 P2 minus P1 upon rho and then all of that under the square root. Now this is an equation you're going to use in the lab if you take my heat transfer course in third year and the mechanical engineering students will you'll be using it to calculate uh, the velocity in uh, a wind tunnel where we do a force convection experiment. The common mistake is is to get the densities confused. When this density here is the density of air. It's the density of the fluid because it's where it came from Bernoulli's equation. And sometimes uh, students get confused and they use the density of the manometer fluid. So we need to calculate the density of air and I'm going to do that using the ideal gas equation of state. Now you could look it up in the table in the back of the book but you notice the pressure is just slightly different uh, than standard atmosphere. Standard atmosphere being 101.3 kPa. So in the uh, lab you're probably going to measure the pressure using a, a local barometer because the pressure varies from day to day and you should really correct for that. So let's use the, the local atmospheric pressure, it's the more correct way to do it. So the pressure is 98 times 10 to the third newtons per meter squared. The gas constant for air after a while you can go look it up but you'll remember it is 207 uh, joules which is Newton meters per kilogram K and the temperature here is 25 degrees C but we've got to convert that 273 in order to put it into K and now you'll notice that uh, the units should work out K goes with K Newton goes with Newton and you can see we have kilogram on the top and cubic meters on the bottom which makes sense so this works out to be one point 146 kilogram per cubic meter. And it always amazes me that there's that much mass in one cubic meter of air. So that's the density of air. Uh, we now need to get uh, P2 minus P1. And we're going to use the uh, deflection of the manometer. And the Pressure at 2 here, of course, is being felt on uh, the right-hand side of the manometer, and the pressure at 1 is being felt on the left-hand side of the manometer. And remember from Chapter 2 that in air, air has such a low density, we don't consider the uh, pressure to change significantly with elevation. So uh, the pressure on this side is P1, and the pressure on this side is P2. So let me just scroll to the next page, and we'll calculate uh, we're going to calculate P2 minus P1 just using our manometer relations, which was the, the gamma of the manometer fluid times this height, which is uh, 20 millimeters. Remember, that comes from, that's chapter 2. So let me just scroll to a new page so we can continue. Okay, so using our manometer theory, let me write this down, P2 minus P1 comes from the manometer. P2 minus P1 is then going to be the, the gamma of the manometer fluid times H. We're told that the specific gravity is 0.8, so the, the gamma of the manometer fluid is, is uh, 0.8, sorry, it's 0 0.85, 0 0.85 times the gamma water times the, the deflection of the manometer. So that's going to equal 0 0.85. The specific or specific weight of water is nine seven nine oh oops newtons per cubic meter and then zero point zero uh, two zero meters and that will give you the pressure difference 
uh, between the, the stagnation pressure at P2 and the static pressure at P1. And that works out to, I got 166.4 uh, pascals or newtons per meter squared. So now we can make our substitution. Remember we had that, that uh, V1 equals 2 P2 minus P1 over the row of air, square rooted. So we can take 2 times 166.4 newtons per meter squared over the density of air, which we calculated to be 1.146 kilogram, kilograms per cubic meter. And you should always check, right, if we put in here that a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, we should be able to check the units here. Kilograms go with kilograms, and uh, that meter is going to make that a single meter, and then we cross that meter, and that's going to make a squared. So we're going to have meters squared per second squared, and then when we take the root square root, we're going to have meter per second. So it's always worth checking that out taking just a moment to do that and we get 17.0 meters per second and that's the uh, velocity of air in the wind tunnel now you can actually take that uh, pitot tube in the wind tunnel and you can traverse it we have it set up in the basement of Kerr Hall so that that pitot tube can be traversed and you can see how uniform the flow is across the cross section of the wind tunnel and so that's a really important example, especially for uh, mechanical engineers that use wind tunnels.